Hi, welcome to the first episode of my critical let's play of Half-Life 1. Um, this is going to be a little bit different from my previous critical let's plays, partly because I haven't played this game for quite a long time. Um, but I've been wanting to play it again, so I thought I might as well document it and talk to myself while I do this. Um, so there might be a bit more kind of reactionary stuff as than there has been in my previous videos. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, it's also going to be a bit different because Half-Life is a game without levels, so I'm not sure how I'm going to separate the videos, but let's see how to do that. And I'm also recording this on my MacBook, whereas all my previous Let's Plays have been on my consoles, where I haven't had to worry about sound levels or anything like that. So hopefully this goes okay. Um, so Half-Life is a really interesting game, and I've got a really interesting relationship with it. Um, Probably when I first played it, it had probably been out for a couple of years. Um, that would have been about 1999 or something. And it was totally unlike any other video game I'd ever played. It was very strange and I wasn't quite sure, you know, how to approach it or what it was doing. It was very weird to me. Um, and we'll talk about why it was weird as we go on a bit. Um, and there's a lot of things now that are quite conventional in video game design and just how 3D spaces, especially are presented in video games that really started with Half-Life, I think. Um, there might be earlier versions of some of the things we're going to talk about. It's always risky to say anything did anything first, but Half-Life really normalized a whole lot of really interesting things, especially in terms of how 3D spaces are organized. Um, I think there's probably other people out there who would have far more interesting things, or have said far more interesting things about Half-Life than I'm going to be able to say. In particular, Dan Golding and Robert Yang have both done really interesting analyses of this game. But, I don't know, I will bastardize some of their findings and make some of my own. So I guess, let's start. I'm going to skip the training room hazard course, which is actually really interesting. But, I'm just going to get straight into the actual game. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. So Half-Life starts with this train, um, train trip into the Black Mesa Research Facility. Um, remember that character, I'm going to talk about him in a little bit. Turning the volume down a bit, because they're not actually saying anything important. You're just getting this kind of robotic woman's voice telling you kind of about the weather and stuff. So you're going into this deep underground lab on this train, and you start, you're already kind of moving. You know, you don't start on the surface and get into the train. Um, for some interesting technical reasons that Robert Yang has gotten into before, which is essentially you can't connect a door to a train in Half-Life. Um, you can't have one entity stuck to another entity. Um, but you've got this long train trip, um, and you can kind of just move around here and look at all the windows at anything. It's also industrial stuff happening. Um, this is kind of a first I'm going to turn that down, it's really distracting listening to her talk while I'm trying to talk. Um, so one of the main things Half-Life normalized in like the late 90s was it was a time where a lot of games were using cutscenes, in particular pre-rendered kind of full motion video cutscenes, because you can make those look very good while you still couldn't make actual in-game visuals look that tremendous. So a lot of um, games were using full motion video. What Half-Life does really interestingly is you, there are no cutscenes, there are no third person cutscenes at all. You're constantly in control of your character, Gordon Freeman, and you can always move around. Um, and except for one moment of a game, it's just one long seamless uh, forward moving of time. You just kind of, there's always this sense that you could go back to, you could walk back to the start of the game from wherever you are because you know where you walk to get here. So it's not separated into levels in what in a traditional video game sense of like level one, level two, level three. There's just a constant walking through the environment, um, an environment that feels believable. I don't want to say realistic because it's a terrible term, but it's a believable, long networked environment. Um, which is fleshed out even more in the um, expansion packs of the game, or the DLC as you would call it now, Opposing Force and Blue Shift, which put you in control of two other characters and their own stories happening at the same time. It's Gordon Freeman's story. 
uh, and they go to other places in the Black Mesa compound as well. So that security guard I mentioned right at the start, knocking on a door. In Blue Shift, you're controlling that character and you see Gordon Freeman go past the train. So you get to see all these different bits of the Black Mesa compound. So these words appearing on screen are the only kind of exposition you get in the entire game. They tell you your name, they tell you what you are, you're a research assistant, you're a PhD, and essentially you're going to work. So it's a really long intro, and when I was like, how old was I, 13 years old or so, I'm just like, what's going on? Why haven't I shot anything yet? Um, it was just very strange to me, this kind of, um, you know, this kind of thing. I, you can graffiti everywhere, which is really for the multiplayer, but um, you can do it in single player as well. So just do some public vandalism. I should be looking at the windows more, sorry. So this long, non-violent introduction was super interesting to me as a kid. Actually, it was mostly just annoying because I'm like, where are the aliens to shoot? Um, I just wasn't really sure what was going on. But it's actually a really great, and other people have pointed this out, it's a great metaphor for the, the way the whole game um, progresses, which is essentially on rails, you know. You go where the game tells you to go. So there's this character here in his suit and tie, which we're never really introduced to, but we will see him just kind of appear throughout the game. Uh, he's the G-man. And he's never called that in the game, but if you go into the editor that came with the game originally, his model is called the G-Man. What was I talking about? Right, so you're on rails at the start, like you go where the game tells you to go. And that's pretty much how the whole game plays out. And I said something similar on the first episode of my Call of Duty videos, when you're like thrown in the back of a car, and that kind of opening, that like non-violent cinematic on rails in a piece of transport opening, really started with this train ride and you see it in so many games now um, Call of Duty, Far Cry 2 um, plenty of others which are currently skipping my mind but this idea of you get in a vehicle and go for an environment to kind of contextualize that environment so the security guard just mentioned that I'm running late um, so I should probably talk more about the story of the game um, or at least how the story is told and so the story in Half-Life is really interesting just in the way you're always in Gordon Freeman's body. You never really get any exposition beyond those few words you've already gotten. So the story is always just kind of told in whispers. You click on people to make them talk to you. Um, so like the story is never that clear in Half-Life, and it's not that clear in Half-Life 2 either, you don't really know what's going on, except what you see right in front of you. So you know there's aliens and whatnot, but you're not, you never really quite have a full picture. Which makes sense, because no one person ever really should have a free, the full picture. So it's this nice kind of commitment to being immersed in a single character. I had a pirated version as a kid, so I don't know if like, there was an instruction manual that gave you more um, context. So there's a bit of foreboding there. Some technical issues have been happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always enjoy, I've never played this on Mac, so I'm trying to figure out the controls still. Alright, that's crouch. <laughs> so there's always a lot of things you can click on in this game, which is great. Um, so you've got no like compass or anything like that, but you've got these words of a wall that kind of tell you where you can go. Um, you know, I was told I need to get in my hazard suit, so let's go find my hazard suit. So even out of your train, you're still not shooting stuff yet. And it's just this long, slow entry. You can kind of just walk around a bit. So they really give it this real sense of an actual space before anything happens. 
There's that guy again. Doesn't look very happy. So it's a real kind of, it looks like an actual space, right? Like, so before this game, all the video games I played were levels. I had the games like Doom or um, games on my Super Nintendo or PlayStation. Whereas this doesn't feel like levels so much as um, just one continuous space. So if you saw there, there was a loading screen and it took like a split second, but back on my old computer, it probably would have frozen for five seconds. But what it's doing, and I think this is probably like common knowledge now, but I wouldn't have known this as a kid, was like really, if I was to no clip and kind of go through the walls and go down that corridor, it would be a dead end. There would be no corridor going either way. So, but when I walk here, I trigger and a new level loads and I'm in a totally different level now. And now back there, that's a dead end. All those people that were next to me weren't, aren't there anymore. Um, so it's just a different world, a different level that overlaps the old level. So it feels like a continuous moving through space. And um, which is just a really great thing. Like it pretty much just exits one level and enters another level that looks the same and gives you this real sense that you're just continuously moving. <laughs> I just like interacting with everything. Um, you can see it. So the other thing I haven't mentioned is that another reason my um, Another reason my kind of relationship with Half-Life is weird, beyond just being nostalgic, is that it's probably the only game where I've mucked around in a level editor for. I never really did that as a kid with many games. Oh, there's mine. Apparently I have a child. That's not something many people often talk about. Um, so right, so I spent some time with a level editor of this game when I was a kid, like building my own levels and stuff. So I feel like I probably have a much more intimate understanding about how this game works on a technological level than I do many other video games. So that's my hazard suit. Um, so it's essentially the diegetic um, justification for having a HUD, for having armor. And there's times of a game where Gordon Freeman should probably die but doesn't. And everyone's like, oh, thank God for the hazard suit. So I followed the green line, now let's follow the blue line. So there's also some music now. Communications interface online. Right on through the Have a very well, you're in the barrel safe today. day. Give me my glasses again. So the music's interesting in the game because it's um it doesn't loop forever, which is another thing every previous game I'd ever played done, just constantly looping music. Whereas in Half-Life, there's just moments where a track will play and it'll be a minute or two long and then it will stop playing again. So there was just a lot of things about this game that were very strange at the time, which were just, you know, things I'd never seen a game do before, and which now are entirely normal. So we get this real sense that we're just going down really deep. You know, that we've taken the train down and just kept going down and down and down. And now we're going down elevators and down ramps. We just feel like we're going very deep into a facility. Ah, Gordon. Here you are. We just sent the sample down to the test chamber. We've boosted the anti-mass spectrometer 105 percent Bit of gamble, but we need the It should be fine. Is very concerned that we get a conclusive analysis of today's sample. I gather they went to some length to get it. So a consequence of this not having any, you know, cutscenes or any part where the player is in control is that you never actually have to watch people 
do what you're meant to watch them do. Like, I don't have to stand here while they're talking. I could be, like, jumping in circles or whatever. Or when I was getting the train in, like, I didn't have to be looking out the windows. I could have just been looking at my feet rolling in a circle. Um, and, like, people like to call pretty reductively, I think. They, you know, tend to say things like, oh, they're essentially cutscenes. It's like, no, they're not. They're not essentially cutscenes at all. They're just simply not cutscenes. There are things happening in the world and the very fact that you could choose not to look at them is a really powerful thing. Like, seeing something that you don't have to see makes a big difference in being forced to look at it. Like, the fact that there is always the potential of me just looking at my feet. That changes the meaning of looking at something. So saying the train ride in is, a, you know, essentially a cutscene. It completely misses the kind of sensations you have from being able to move around that train. It's about to go critical. So there's a lot of trepidation, a lot of kind of tensions and anxiety with all the staff. Like, it's clearly stuff going on that they're not entirely happy with. But the administrator wants that stuff done, so I guess we have to do it. Oops, made him more. Half Life's also interesting because there's like a bunch of different visual updates to the game over time. I'm pretty sure the first version they didn't actually have dangly 3D tights. I think their tights were just painted to their shirts. Um, when Blue Shift came out, there was like a kind of graphics overhaul of it, different gun models and all of that. Um, and the PlayStation 2 version had, um, you know, newer graphical models as well. I think that's when the 3D tights and name badges were introduced. That's like an entirely boring thing you probably don't even care about. But as someone who played this game a lot on a lot of different platforms, I find it interesting. So now we're just trapped in this room and like 13 year old me playing this game is like, what the hell? What, what is this game? Why haven't I shot anything yet? I was also amazed as a kid I could stand over handrails that everything was an actual solid object. I hadn't played many 3D games yet. So it was also the first game where I learned how to use a keyboard and mouse controls, uh, which was so difficult at first. I don't think we often appreciate just how difficult that is um, before you learn how to do it. So the idea of using WASD instead of arrows was very strange to me. Um, and Half-Life was a game that taught me how to do this. So I'm not sure what we're doing here really. It is some kind of project. We don't really need to know. Gordon clearly knows, but it doesn't matter. It's probably a time when I was a kid where I knew 
What this guy was saying off by heart, I did this so many times. So still this constant sense of something's kind of going wrong. So on the PlayStation 2 version of the game, um, there was like this, these co-op missions you could do separate. And again, there were different characters. Uh, these two women scientists. And their job in the morning of this fateful day it was preparing the specimen. So they're currently down there somewhere on a bottom level. And you could hear this happening at the top, the um, people talking to Gordon while you're pushing this onto the elevator. So you're the people who send the specimen to Gordon. And I love that through all the different Half-Life games, just like crossing back and forward between different characters and to get the full story, which is kind of what, what I enjoyed about Call of Duty as well. So I guess let's push this yellow thing into a laser and where nothing will go wrong. Well, something went wrong. Suddenly, aliens. So you've got these chapters, like chapter one. This is the chapter unforeseen consequences. Um, but yeah. It is this constant moving forward. It's not like you go to a main menu, but you select the level unforeseen consequences. So shit's gone down. Finally. So things like broken doors and that just to make it seem like everything's falling apart, essentially. Oh man, the Gibbs. I forgot about Gibbs. People just explode into kind of these comical organs. So you're still really not sure what's going on. So I don't have to be listening to these people right now. I could just run on if I wanted to. Alright, right, so I kind of just lied, like I can't get through the next door until he comes and unlocks it for me. So that kind of forces you to listen to him. So you got these aliens here. So there's doors that are locked and you have to get scientists or security guards to follow you to unlock them for you. So this is back in the control room now. So you kind of got these platformy things like that, you know, jumping over things or getting past lasers. So you've got your first alien encounter before you have any way to defend yourself, which is pretty interesting. Like you're still just kind of 
running around, you're running away from the aliens before you're actually fighting them. I always loved this as a little kid because I was super gross. <laughs> it's just so stupid. And there we have our trusty crowbar. So it's still very much, I guess, of an age of video games. I know you still get it now, really. We just lots of people die for not a whole a lot of great reasons. Um, like sometimes they're just entirely comical, silly reasons, like like that one there, and suddenly zombies. I'm always torn between letting that zombie actually kill him so I can take his gun. Or doing the right thing and helping him live. So here he's with zombie things wearing science uniforms. Essentially the head head crabs have taken over their heads and it's pretty gross. Come with me, you have a gun. So this kind of interaction between different sides of that, like the AI was a big deal at its time, at least I felt like it was. So here you've got the head crab sitting on the scientist just like near the zombies to kind of like let you know how this is happening in case you haven't got it yet. So you can just like mash up bodies. Um, I don't remember it happening like that, but anyway. So we've been walking back through the um, back through the same way we went down, really, except now everything's kind of fallen apart. A lot, every you know, a lot of those people are dead. It's like bullets on one of these, but I forget which one. This one. Thanks, Guthrie. Really tempted to kill that guy and take his gun. Coming, dude. Let's get out of here. So you get back to the train station. Oh. I think I got myself stuck. Oh dear. I haven't been auto saving either. I wonder if cheats work. No. Nope. Oh. That's annoying. What is the quick save button? There we go, sweet. So I don't even actually have to go out here and I feel bad killing this guy, but I feel like that's what Gordon would do. He would come out here and try to get on the train where the train is clearly broken. Sorry, dude. So, so like the game doesn't tell you, like Gordon doesn't talk to himself and is like, I guess I need to find another way out or anything silly like that, but you know, if like you get here, you're clearly not getting out of the train the way you got in, so you've got to find another way out. Um, 
and it's just really elegant and nuanced uh, and subtle rather in the way it never really tells you super explicitly you're just like well I guess I got to go another way in full honesty if I wasn't recording this for an audience I would totally have killed that guy for his pistol by now but whatever so you've got these machines to give you health I'm on full health because I'm really good Oh, and you have to do these weird jumps. I'm going to kill this guy. Um, so if I just jump, I can't get up on there. But if I jump and then crouch in midair, then I can get on it. And this is an annoying, super fiddly move, which um, I'm glad hasn't become normal. I'm glad that's one thing most games didn't pick up from this game. So you just get these kind of vignettes happening in different places. So I can't help that guy. These really interesting framings like that. So when I was playing Call of Duty, I spoke a lot about, um, you know, the way that game frames stuff in the architecture. Uh, and, you know, the player kind of becomes the camera person. Know, setting up the shots that again really kind of started with Half-Life so this is great kind of cinematic moments like that you know I was around here and when I passed an invisible light here you heard a couple of gunshot sounds so you got the idea that something was happening around the corner and then you come around just in time to see them both fall down um, and it's just really interesting like it was really interesting at the time that real sense of um, being in a movie, I guess, essentially. So then you go the hand eye enemies, which are a fun time. I found this game really scary when I was a kid as well. Um, like, listen to all the audio. Um, you know, it's, it's just so chaotic and everything's falling apart. It's kind of terrifying. that glitched. An alien was meant to appear when that happened. I think I've got auto aim on or something. <laughs> uh, it's a little over the top. Uh, give me a second. I'm just going to Yeah, I don't need auto aim, that's for sure. I'm just moving out of perspective. There's a flag then. It's the way they react to that. It's great. Like all these things that are totally normal now um, at the time. All right. There's a door you can't get into. The grenades on the other side. This guy's dead. But then around this corner, you kind of find it. So you have these kind of real video game puzzles. It's kind of weird architecture. Like this looks more like the kind of setup you'd see in Wolfenstein 3D than an actual science lab. 
but you know the textures and everything make it kind of work within the sense and it kind of points to the time it was made right where you kind of you're going to accept certain kind of video gaming architectures even while the space still feels quite coherent Sorry, this animation's missing quite well. Look at that. The cube is like previous weapons. We can kind of set up like a double weapon set. Um, but yeah, the animation seems to be being weird. This is probably like the Mac version not cooperating very well. But this will appear again. I guess we can reset somewhere. That's weird. All right, so this is going to be a glitchy playthrough by the looks of it. I probably stop the video soon, shouldn't I? So we got this sound behind the door. And the door shuts as well. Yeah, that first introduction to the slaves. So all these aliens, like their names are never mentioned in the actual game, but if you spend time with Yellow you learn their names and essentially. I can tell I played this game at a certain time in my life as well, since I know like how many bullets it takes to kill a head crab and stuff like that. Like I know the maps, just like I know Doom's map off the top of my head. Um, so I'm gonna stop this video here before I jump around. Um, oh hello. Oh, all right. Oh, I'm gonna fall down. That works too. So now I'm gonna stop it here. That's a cliff, that's a cliff, oh god. Wow, what have I done? Bolts. I just messed everything up. Alright, well I'm just gonna stop recording now because I think I screwed up somehow. Right, anyway. Well, that was a fun end to uh, that recording. Anyway, so that's the first while in Half-Life. And in the next episode, we will continue on. I should just stop recording now because that kind of got weird. Goodbye.